Funding for this edition of Remember Them with Steve Adubato and Jackie Tricarico has been provided by PSENG, committed to providing safe, reliable energy now and in the future. NJM Insurance Group, serving New Jersey's drivers, homeowners, and business owners for more than 100 years. RWJ Barnabas Health, the New Jersey Education Association. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, here when you need us most, now and always. Prudential Financial, New Jersey Institute of Technology, NJIT, makes industry-ready professionals in all STEM fields. And by the Russell Berry Foundation, making a difference. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Globe. And by New Jersey Monthly the magazine of the Garden State, available at newsstands. I'm Steve Adubato. Welcome to a series we created called Remember Them. I'm here with our executive producer, Jackie Tricarico, who co-hosts this show with us. Jackie, we doing all right today? We're doing great. Excited to get this one started. So listen, uh, this is a series that looks at a whole range of different people who are no longer with us. They're from New Jersey, connected to New Jersey, but have had impact not just on the state and the nation, but in many cases, the world. Over my left shoulder, you see the book that was written by our longtime friend, Richard Roper, about Newark Mayor Ken Gibson, Ken Gibson, the first African-American elected to a city on the eastern seaboard. The interview we're about to do is with a historian out of Rutgers, Junius Williams, who knows the city really well. Jackie, this is, quote, before your time. What strikes you about Junius Williams talking about Ken Gibson? Also, the other person we're featuring today is Amiri Baraka, who is a playwright, poet, activist, um, fascinating figure, and the father of Newark Mayor Roz Baraka, what, as you were preparing and researching for this show, what connected with you? Well, there's a big connection between Mayor Ken Gibson and Amiri Baraka. And Amiri Baraka uh, really getting into politics, even though he was an artist and a playwright, he had his hand in politics. Uh, but something that came up that I didn't realize was when the mayor won the, that election, it wasn't the first time he ran for mayor. Uh, it was that was 1970. Time. He ran in 1966 right. and lost. Right, and he lost in Newark, but why did he lose, Steve? Because I know you you know a little bit more background on that um, and how things shifted in Newark, and that is what led to him winning later on. Well, it's it's such a complicated history, and there's so many books and, and places you can find information about Newark, but I will tell you this. As a young boy growing up in Newark, the 1960s into the 70s, a very tough time, 1967 rebellion slash riots, um, Almost 30 people were killed in those riots. The city was taken over by the National Guards. They, there were tanks on our street that were trying to prevent the riot that went on for many days from continuing. People were killed. There were snipers on buildings. There were police officers that were assaulting others and were assaulted themselves. It was a brutal time. That was 1967. 1966, Gibson runs for mayor. He loses. He runs again in 1970. The city has changed after the rebellion slash riots. So many more whites, so many whites, mo whites moved out to the suburbs. Our family stayed. My dad, Steve Adubato Sr., would be doing a feature on him as well, um, was one of the only white Italian-American political leaders that supported Ken Gibson in 19. 70. It was a bold move. It was a controversial move in the neighborhood we grew up on. But this is not about my dad. It's about Ken Gibson. And Junius Williams talks about him and Amiri Baraka. And in the second half, Jackie, I'm interviewing Amiri Baraka from 2012 at the New Jersey Performing Arts Center, right? Yeah, yeah. And that was just um, a couple of years before he passed. Uh, so we'll have that interview on the back end. Uh, but first up, we are going to hear Junius Williams talking about Mayor Ken Gibson and Amiri Baraka and their connection to one another in Newark. Check out Junius Williams, the history of two iconic and very important figures in our Remember Them series. We are honored 
to be joined by Junius Williams, who's the official NORC historian. He's an author, a civil rights activist, host of a podcast called Everything's Political. Good to see you, Junius. Good to see you too, Steve. It's been a while. It has. And this is a really important segment because it's part of a series that we're doing simply called um, New Jersey Leaders Who Matter, Powering Equity and Social Justice. Junius, let's start with uh, Ken Gibson. We're going to be showing some pictures uh, of, of different of these three folks that we're going to be talking about. Elected to mayor and elected in 1970 as the mayor of Newark, the first black mayor of a major northeastern city. Why was Ken Gibson so important beyond being the first in that regard? Uh, Ken Gibson represented a power shift in the city of Newark. Uh, for some time, black people had been in the majority, and yet the uh, official hierarchy uh, for running the city didn't reflect that population. We had uh, two councilmen, one at large and one for the central ward, and that was it. <clears throat> the police department was 95% white, mostly Irish and Italian. Uh, most of the people in city who worked in city hall at the high positions were white. And did not live in the city. And did not live in the city. And so it was time for a change. So Ken was our choice. I was his first campaign manager. And uh, what we had to do was to convince people that uh, a black man could win. Despite the numbers, a lot of people just didn't believe it. And of course, Ed Mijo had a lot of friends and uh, the, the black- The previous friend. mayor who went to jail for corruption and frankly being tied to the mob. Um, but, but also Mayor Gibson, who I was uh, honored to know as, as a young man growing up in Newark, he also brought a sense of calm to the city after the 1967 rebellion. Did he not? Yes, I think that was probably the greatest gift uh, that he had and that he used. Uh, Ken was uh, very laid back, very calm. Uh, and I think that convinced a lot of white people that they didn't have anything to worry about. Uh, and, and that was important during that day because the, the, the city was very racially polarized. There was a man named uh, Anthony Imperiali in the North Ward. My neighborhood in your neighborhood, my neighborhood now, uh, your father's neighborhood. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, your father and him had a run-in as to who was going to be the chairman of the Democratic Party, and your father won. So this, this was a time of uh, racial polarization, unlike anything that I've seen until now. I would say that the imperial people were like the Proud Boys and the folks who stormed the White House. I'm sorry, uh, the uh, Capitol. The Capitol. And then, folks, uh, check it out. It's not an understatement what Mr. Williams is sharing right now. It was a bad time. It just really was. But, but I want to ask you this about Amiri Baraka, playwright, poet, but activist. His contribution, and by the way, I was honored to interview, in, in, interview Mr. Baraka at NJ PAC, um, I believe, in the last year of his life. What was his greatest contribution, in your view? He combined art and politics like nobody else that I knew. Uh, he was a nationalist, but at the same time, he kept his eyes on the prize. The prize was to win the mayoralty and the majority of the city council. Now, we didn't do it at the first, the first time, but eventually we did get the council as well, I think in 74, uh, to represent, to be more representative of the people that were here. But uh, Emiri Baraka was, uh, was, was one of a kind. Uh, he had a national and international reputation as a, uh, as a poet, as a writer, as you said, of various kinds. But uh, when, during the rebellion in 1967, a, a policeman hit him in the head and uh, gave him a concussion, blooded his head, and he became known thereafter for his politics because he was then he had a platform that he hadn't that he didn't have before, and he used it to help get Ken Gibson elected. I, uh, Ken Gibson depended upon the organization that Baraka set up called the Committee for Unified Newark more than Ken Gibson wanted to admit. He he did not 
that there was something that uh, was Baraka's idea, <clears throat> and it was called the Black and Puerto Rican Convention, at which time for the election in uh, 1970, uh, people were supposed to come to that convention in 1969 and show their wares. Uh, some people did, most people didn't, but by that time, most of us had decided we wanted can, and like all conventions, there was a, let's say it was a, a, a the people liked Ken a lot. But at the same time, there was this idea. And, and I think that idea was probably one of the most, uh, uh, it, was, it was not only generous, but I think it was a very influential idea and people ought to do it more. Yeah, and it's so interesting. I remember uh, being a kid growing up in the city of the, that year, that election. And I'm not going to go into this except to say, in the neighborhood I grew up in, and Junius Williams knows this better than most, in the neighborhood I grew up in in 1970, in the race between Ken Gibson, who was an engineer, and you, Adonisio, Mayor Hugh Adonisio, who was indicted and ultimately went to jail for being, quote, mobbed up. In my neighborhood, largely Italian-American, virtually everyone voted for Hugh Adonisio. Um, my father happened to go in a different direction and be supportive of Ken Gibson. But that being said, the argument was, even if he was corrupt, at least, quote, he was white. And that's how it was. And, people, and, and Junius, am I overstating that? The runoff between Adnesio and Ken Gibson was a campaign that Adnesio directed toward Emir Baraka. It was strictly based on race. You, you, you can't trust Gibson because Gibson's got uh, Baraka. Now, they didn't know that Gibson turned around and just kind of pushed Baraka aside. They didn't know he would do that at the time. But uh, that was very important. We had, uh, I, the other thing I wanted to say was we had a platform coming out of that convention. Uh, and and uh, that was a very important platform for us. But, but Ken more or less ran on what Ken wanted to run on. To see more Remember Them programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. I'm very grateful that I'm still here. That's me and my daughter when we went to celebrate our first anniversary. With a new kidney, I have strength. They gave me a new lease on life. I'm still going everywhere and exploring new places. Nobody thought I was going to be here. Nobody. And I look forward to getting older with my wife. That's possible now. We're transforming lives through innovative kidney treatments, living donor programs, and world-renowned care at two of New Jersey's premier hospitals. They gave me my normal life back. It's a blessing. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. With NJM, drivers could save up to 25% on their auto insurance. Hey guys, just wondering if you've changed your mind on the whole no mascot thing. You know, because if you are interested, you should really say something because uh, I got a few gigs in the works. So, you know, I might not be available. Hello? <laughs> hey, what's Some up? insurance companies are known for their mascots. Oh, hi, Carl. Hey. NJM is known for what matters. Thank you. Outstanding service you can count on. Where'd you even get this? I know a guy. No jingles or mascots, just great insurance. NJM, get a quote today. Every day, nearly 2 million customers across New Jersey rely on PSE&G to provide natural gas. And every day, PSE&G is committed to doing it safely. That includes making sure you know what to do if you smell gas. A natural gas leak smells like rotten eggs. If you suspect a gas leak, leave your home immediately. Get far away, then call 911. Remember, smell, leave, call. Protect the ones you love. Learn more at PSEG.com slash gas safety. Wow, that, uh, we want to thank Junius Williams for that very in-depth interview and provide some context and history about Ken Gibson primarily, but also Mary Baraka. Jackie, I remember 2012, as we do this program, it was 10 years ago. We're sitting at NJPAC. It was one of the last interviews. It may have been the last interview that Amiri Baraka did. And uh, I will say this, growing up as a kid, Baraka was a, not just a controversial figure, but because we didn't understand who he was and what he stood for, uh, in the community I lived in, which was disproportionately Italian-American, there was great fear. There was anxiety. There was anger. Uh, and so the idea now that I sat down with him and this poet, this playwright, this extraordinarily thoughtful, um, creative, and yes, controversial figure, we sit down and remembering my dad and him were, were connected in some ways around Gibson 
Mayor Gibson, but also enemies politically in other ways. And then to sit down with Roz Baraka, the mayor, and have so many interviews, it just, it just comes full circle. But this is back in 2012. And for you, you can hear about Baraka, but what resonated for you as we throw to this? He just, the way that he speaks, the way he articulates uh, his messages, just you, when he speaks, you want to listen. You want to listen to what he has to say. And I think that has, well, that, you know, back then it really helped with his career, with uh, his messages. Uh, you know, he was very outspoken, very outspoken. And, uh, you know, he and was- And before time, Jackie, this is yeah. pre-Black Lives Matter. This is pre, uh, and again, he was not, well, Dr. King, and I believe there's a book from Dr. King right up there, he was not always aligned with Dr. King because he believed in more um, aggressive forms of protest. So, hey, listen, complex figure. This is 2012. Very controversial, think, very you know, controversial at a lot of times, right? Very controversial. Yeah, but important to listen to him, to think about what he's saying. He, he literally died two years, right at, two, two years after this interview. So I cannot thank the Baraka family and all the folks who provided the footage that will put him in context by showing some older pictures. So Jackie uh, Chicarico, Steve Adubato, this is Remember Them and Remember Them. And one of the people we always have to remember is Amiri Baraka. This is a Conversations at the New Jersey Performing Arts Center. I'm Steve Adubato. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce uh, an icon, not just in the city of Newark and in New Jersey, but in the United States of America. Amiri Baraka, poet, playwright, community activist, and someone who I grew up hearing about <laughs> as a young man in here in the city of Newark. Good to have you with us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. You've had a fascinating life and career, have you not? Yeah, I'd say that. <laughs> <laughs> when did you know, and by the way, I, I, my dad, Steve Adubato Sr., and you go back a long way? Oh, God. 45, maybe 50 years, yeah. Politics, community activism, um, not Politics. always on the same side Politics. of certain issues. Yeah. Uh, but uh, in a tough time in Newark, 1967 riots as a little boy growing up in the city. It was a tough yeah. time, no? Very tough time. I uh, was luck lucky to survive that time, as a matter of fact. It Why was do you really, say that? Well, uh, the sides were drawn, and really, essentially, racially. They were not, uh, although that's not true, your father, was smart enough to see around that and sneak through that, but uh, it was, you know, it was hard, hard times. And, a lot of hatred, uh, wasn't there? Hmm? A lot of hatred. Oh, yeah, yeah. White and black hatred. Well, see, the problem was that the, the black people wanted something different from what they had, and the kind of, you know, the kind of hard line Adnesio Spina thing that was out. We weren't going to accept that. We should clarify for folks, you Adnesio was the mayor of the city of Newark. Uh, a corrupt mayor, controlled by the mob. The, yeah. the police department was a, a corrupt police department. Dominic Spina was the head of the police department, and, and African Americans were, were targeted. Yeah, well, he targeted me, I know that. <laughs> uh, not for your poetry. <laughs> no, as a matter of fact, one time we were trying to do a poetry reading at this place called The Loft, and the police stopped us from, going, from even going in there. One time I was rehearsing a play in that loft, and a policeman came and took the script out of my hand. I mean, see, that's different, <laughs> different Newark. People don't even know yeah. that exists, but it was. Um, beyond the political activism, which yeah. continues today, um, because you have a great commitment to the city, you love this city very much. When did you know, Mr. Baraka, that uh, poetry, writing, would be such an important part of your life? Well, when I, actually, when I was small, I used to write like I wrote letters to President Roosevelt, yeah. although I never, <laughs> I couldn't, I didn't know how to mail them, I stuck them in the, in the radio. <laughs> right. You start a newspaper at 10 years old. Right, I had a newspaper, right, I, I wish I wrote out all the copies myself, you know, and passed them out to our local. What was so, the message? Well, that the message was at that time that somebody was gonna rob us. I don't know where I got that. <laughs> In my mind, but and you were in Newark, though. I was in Newark. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right up the street. Right. Yeah. I was. I was born and uh, raised in this town. My folks have been in this town almost 100 years. Mm. We've been here a, a minute, you know. And uh, the whole writing thing, actually, when I got to Barringer, you know, Barringer High School. Yeah. Where. Your father went, David Zinzo went, we all went there to Payne. Donald Payne, yeah, yeah, Bill Payne. We all were there at the same time. And, uh, Donald Payne. I took a class in writing, you see. But that's why I went to Barringer, because Barringer 
It's the only place you could take Latin and Spanish and creative writing. So, so I used to come from the Central Ward on the five Kenny bus every morning to go to Barringer. Sometimes you, I have to write, run back. <laughs> did, did you did you know? I mean, who thought at the time? And maybe, maybe did, maybe didn't, that I could make a living doing this? Yeah. Well, it's not, I don't think that came first. First, the passion comes, you, it's what you want to do. And I always tell students that, you know. Because you first teach, find you're, out you're what always you a teacher. Do. Yeah. And then you, you'll, 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 you'll find a way, but just find something you're passionate about mm. and you want to do, and you'll find a way. You just keep, you won't be rich. You know, I always tell them not. You want to be a poet? Swear to poverty, because that's about it. But, mm. uh, no, you have to find out something you want. And that was one thing Beringer was, although I, we, were, we were little minorities in there, and sometimes we had to fight our way to get back home, but still there was a level of instruction in there that was good. Did you know that, that there would be no way to separate your political activism from, from your writing? Well, not at the beginning. The big, you see, because this, you have to remember, it's, it's the, the, the country itself that, Changes. You understand what I mean? So that uh, early 1950s in Newark is one thing. I mean, I went to school here. First, I went to college here at uh, Rutgers when there was only two buildings. In Newark Rutgers there was one down on Rector Street and one next to the Veterans Administration. And then I went to Howard. But all this changes, you know, so that by the time I got to, to college, the idea of writing was important to me. But it wasn't until later that the whole movement, the civil rights movement, began to be, uh, you know, by the time I got out of the Air Force, uh, it was about the same time that uh, the Montgomery bus boycott, you see. So I got out of the service. At the same time, they were boycotting the buses in, mm -hmm. in Montgomery, you know, Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King. That was a different kind of reality, different kind of understanding. And uh, so by the time I then went to New York to live. In Greenwich Village? Yeah, I moved to Village because I wanted to be a writer. That's, I figured all the big time intellectuals were. I went there. And Who there else was, was hanging out there? Barringer there, too. Who else was hanging out there in the Village at the time? There was a guy named Alan Polite who was a poet, black, and he was a cross-country runner at Barringer. And I was a cross-country runner, so he became my idol. But uh, then I understood he went to New York to write. And so that sounds interesting. When did you know that, the f oh, let me try it this way. The first piece that you wrote that got attention, I don't mean mass, yeah. Appeal, but got attention. People said, this guy has something. He's talented. He speaks with a powerful voice, and we need to listen. What was that piece? Well, it was a, a poem called Preface to a 20 Volume Suicide Note. Hold on. Preface to a 20 Volume mm, suicide, suicide Note. Right. <laughs> it doesn't roll off the tongue. No, it doesn't roll off the tongue. <laughs> but when I, I published that in a, in a little. Uh, journal in Taos, New Mexico. Mm. And uh, I got a postcard from Langston Hughes saying, you know, hail Leroy from Harlem, I understand you colored. <laughs> and I said, must be a pretty bad guy, you know. I mean, I get a, a postcard from Langston Hughes, who I always knew, you know, even growing up in Newark, you know, you had to know Langston, you know, he was in the newspapers and stuff. So that was, my understanding that I really was doing something, mm. you know, significant in any way. Do you have um, anything that you want to do, just for a minute? Uh, wise, one, and that's spelled Y apostrophe S, W-H-Y apostrophe S, W-I-S-E. If you ever find yourself somewhere lost and surrounded by enemies who won't let you speak in your own language, who destroy your statues and instruments, who ban your um boom ba boom, you're in trouble. They ban your um boom ba boom, you're in deep, deep trouble. Probably take you several hundred years to get out. At the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, there's a railroad made of human bones, black ivory. Black Ivory.
Hmm. So that's from a, a book called Wise, you know, Wise, Wise. And I got that from Jimmy Baldwin, who said, Jimmy Baldwin, James Baldwin. James Baldwin, who said, you know, if you want to know something, ask why. And if you keep asking why, you'll get wise. I hope this is relevant for other people, but I'm going to do something selfish. Growing up uh, in the city of Newark in the 1960s and 70s, and knowing or thinking I knew about you as a fiery, outspoken, controversial figure who often said things, at least as I interpreted them, as, as very uh, anti-white. Mm. Simplistic explanation, I'm yeah, sure. that's true. Do you think we are any, the, the fact that we're having this conversation here in this context in Newark, I don't know what it means or doesn't mean. Are we any better off? Well, it, it's, it's always a kind of a dual duality to that. On one hand, it'd be hard to say that if you have Afro-American as the president, that's the same as the time when I got dragged up the street and beaten the head. It's not the same. My son, Raz, is a councilman here yeah. in the South He's a fine councilman. Yeah. And so it's not the same, but we still have fundamentally the same problems. Fundamentally? Well, racism is still alive and well. I've never heard a president talked about as badly as, say, uh, Obama. Uh, the people, say, up, up the street here from mm. New Jersey PAC are still living below standard. You know, it's still very hard and, uh, you know, uh, some of the violence at, at, in, in that school in, in Connecticut. We're taking uh, there right was a after guy you. shot right in front of my house. He fell right to the bottom of the steps and bled to death as my wife and I watched it. In Newark. In Newark, right in front of our house. So it's, it's a mixed kind of situation. On one hand, the real, quote, integration has gone on at the top level of America. But in terms of the other, what can I say, 90-some percent of the Afro-American people mm -hmm. are still hurting. Tell me you're hopeful. Well, I'm hopeful because we're alive and we're not going to stop. I mean, you know, we, and we have a, 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 a legacy and a history of struggle. I mean, me struggling, my son struggling, my wife struggling, they're not the first black people who struggle. It, they, but they know that that's what they have to do as a matter of making some motion, you know. You honor us by being here. Well, thank you very much. To watch more Remember Them with Steve Adubato and Jackie Tricarico, find us online and follow us on social media. Remember Them with Steve Adubato and Jackie Tricarico has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding has been provided by PSE&G, NJM Insurance Group, RWJ Barnabas Health, the New Jersey Education Association, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, Prudential Financial, New Jersey Institute of Technology, and by the Russell Berry Foundation. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Globe and by New Jersey Monthly. I'm very grateful that I'm still here. That's me and my daughter when we went to celebrate our first anniversary. With a new kidney, I have strength. They gave me a new lease on life. I'm still going everywhere and exploring new places. Nobody thought I was going to be here. Nobody. And I look forward to getting older with my wife. That's possible now. We're transforming lives through innovative kidney treatments, living donor programs, and world-renowned care at two of New Jersey's premier hospitals. They gave me my normal life back. It's a blessing. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. With NJM, drivers could save up to 25% on their auto insurance. Hey guys, just wondering if you've changed your mind on the whole no mascot thing. You know, because if you are interested, you should really say something because uh, I got a few gigs in the works. So, uh, you know, I might not be available. Hello? <laughs> hey, what's Some that? insurance companies are known for their mascots. Oh, hi, Carl. Hey. NJM is known for what matters. Thank you. Outstanding service you can count on. Where'd you even get this? I know a guy. No jingles or mascots, just great insurance. NJM, get a quote today. Every day, nearly 2 million customers across New Jersey rely on PSE&G to provide natural gas. And every day, PSE&G is committed to doing it safely. That includes making sure you know what to do if you smell gas. A natural gas leak smells like rotten eggs. If you suspect a gas leak, leave your home immediately. Get far away, then call 911. 
Remember, smell, leave, call. Protect the ones you love. Learn more at PSCG.com slash gas safety.